I've ever met uh, is a professor named Dr. Shirley Mullen. Uh, Kimberly and I both had Dr. Mullen as a professor in college, and she is a history professor. Um, every student at the college was required to take one of the classes that she taught, which was one of those general surveys of history. And uh, that was the first class that we both took from her. Well, since I was a history major, uh, I pretty much decided I would take any class that she was teaching. So I found room in my schedule every time she was teaching a class, if I could, to be able to take her class. Because she was inspiring and brilliant in all kinds of ways. Um, she, her name, as I said, is Dr. Shirley Mullen. She had a doctorate in history, which would make sense since she taught history, but she didn't think that that was enough. So she decided to get another doctorate in philosophy because she liked how the history thinkers thought and wanted to understand that more. So one of, one of my favorite things about Dr. Mullen is whenever she would be talking or whenever she's responding to something that somebody says, her eyes were moving back and forth, like constantly. I mean, she would she'd be looking back and forth all the time as she was talking. And what she was doing, I realized, is she had so much in her brain that she was trying to choose what to say, when to say it, and how to say it, because she had every piece of information you could ever imagine, and she was trying to pull it all out in the right way. And usually, she got the perfect thing for the perfect time out of her mouth somehow. Now, for all those good things about Dr. Mullen, there were also some other things about Dr. Mullen, one of which were her tests. Her tests were hard. They were all essay tests. There was no multiple choice, no data uh, recall, nothing like that, because she believed that the, the details and the pieces, the events, the dates, the people, that's just the beginning. There's so much more to it than that. So, so they were all essay tests. And I figured, after a couple of her tests, I figured that if you could just understand the question, then you should get a good grade. I mean, they were so complex, they were so deep in the questions she was asking, that it was hard stuff. And really, what she was after is not just the information and the details, but she was after us connecting this piece of history or this event with something else that's similar farther in the future and in some other place and pulling that together to, to conclude some sort of trend or some sort of path through history so that we could then make some sort of a prediction about the future and make some meaning for our lives all at the same time. And this was kind of the way that she just thought. Because she wasn't just about learning knowledge, she was about gaining understanding of that knowledge. And in some of the, the higher level history major classes that she taught, with, I mean, there were like six or eight of us in a room. And she would often say, I want you to be wise students. And she was serious. And she didn't want us to just pick apart this information and be able to say what year the War of 1812 was. But she wanted us to be able to pull these pieces together and make conclusions and build on that and gain understanding and wisdom about the world. And the Bible talks about knowledge and learning in very similar ways to this. Over 20 times in the Bible, the words wisdom and knowledge are linked together. The two are paired together because there's something about those where there's this relationship between knowledge and wisdom for the purpose of eventually us gaining understanding. God wants us to be able to gain some sort of understanding. And throughout the Bible, whenever it talks about wisdom and knowledge, it always talks about it in terms of something that God gives. Wisdom and knowledge are never something that we're just so smart on our own that we're able to find wisdom and knowledge. It's always something that the Lord gives to people. And sometimes that's because people ask for wisdom. As James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God for wisdom. Other times it's uh, you know, when Solomon asks for wisdom. God gives wisdom. These are things that God gives. Because God doesn't just want us to know what's going on in the world. God wants us to understand what God is up to in the world. 
And that's part of wisdom and knowledge and understanding about what God is doing around us. See, God didn't just create the world and leave it up to us to figure it out. That's what's called deism, where God created the world and then God left, and we're on our own. We do not worship a God who is absent. We worship a God who is here, who stays with us so that we can gain knowledge and wisdom and eventually understanding. And if we know what God is up to in the world, then we can better understand what a relationship with Christ is like. If we know what God is up to, we can join God and participate in what God is doing. And we get to be players in what God's doing. And all this wisdom and knowledge and understanding can happen better when we understand something that God has done. Because there was a moment when God shifted in a certain way that allowed us to understand something about God and to learn something about God so that we can understand what it means to be in a relationship with Him. So, because of all this learning and all this scholarship that's kind of wrapped up in this, we could maybe call this a scholar shift. So, we're going to look at a scholar shift that God gives us today. Thank you, John. <laughs> this shift is best found in the book of Colossians. Can you please show up next week, too, because there's another one. <laughs> Uh, we're looking through the book of Colossians. And in the book of Colossians, there really are a bunch of these shifts that it seems like Paul raises to the surface to show these things that God has done that then kind of prompt us to make some sort of shifts in our own life. Things that God has done that so inspire us or so change us or so, so move us to something new that then it, it just causes us to think, do, or live differently. So look in the passage as we read it. Look for the shift that God makes and see what difference that makes for us. So here's Colossians 2. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For, I, for though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. There's a little bit of passion there, isn't there? This yearning and this longing, this hope that these people live in the way that God wants them to. And they discover all the fullness that God has in store. But there was a shift in here. Did you see the shift right in the middle? It was kind of passed over, but it's referred to. The shift that God revealed God's mysterious plan. Now, that happened before, and Colossians isn't so concerned about describing how it happened and when it happened. Colossians is more concerned about what happens because of that. But the shift that God made is God revealed God's mysterious plan. Now, when I read that, I honestly kind of think, wait a minute, mystery? God? I mean, is God like trying to keep something from us? Is God have some special secret hidden away and only a few people can find it? I mean, that doesn't really mesh with the rest of the Bible and what the rest of what we understand about God. God doesn't hold things secret over here until we do the right thing and all of a sudden. I mean, that's just not how God operates. I mean, God is generous and God is loving and God is compassionate, and God loves all. So how, how does this mystery kind of work out? It causes me to ask questions. You know, things like, well, who can actually solve the mystery? Are we supposed to solve the mystery? And why is God keeping something secret? In their culture, in the Greek culture in this day around Jesus, people talked a lot about mysteries. Uh, a lot of the cultures and a lot of the religions actually used the word mystery, and they talked about it. Because for them, what they understood about a mystery is that all the things in the world that we didn't understand, they called mysteries. And a mystery is something that God alone understands. So if something was a mystery, they saw that God was the one who could explain it. God was the one who could understand it. And we just get that from God when God decides to give it to us. 
So I mean, when Paul's talking about a mystery, he's not talking about some secret thing that's in a way that we've got to figure out how to solve. It's something that God gives us understanding of. And that combines with all the ways that the rest of the Bible talks about wisdom and knowledge and understanding, that that's something that God gives. These mysteries are things that God wants to reveal to us, and Paul is saying God has revealed God's mysterious plan. So it's something God wants us to know. That's the mystery part. But then there's this plan part. God revealed God's mysterious plan. Did God have a plan? I mean, God has lots of plans. So what's the mysterious plan that you know God revealed? The Old Testament is basically, if we look at it in the big picture, the Old Testament is preparing us for the new. It's to help get us ready so that we can understand what's coming in the New Testament. And if we look at it that way, then there are a lot of places where God is getting us ready to understand his plan that comes in Christ. For example, we read some of these passages oftentimes right before Christmas. But see if you can see a plan brewing. Um, Isaiah 9 says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. I mean, that's like, there's a plan ahead. It's coming. So never doubt that God has a plan. Um, I think we've probably all heard or seen on a card or written in somebody's yearbook or who knows what, but somehow seen this passage. The Lord gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. There's a plan. And God's saying, it's coming. There's more in store. It's coming and it's ahead. All throughout the Old Testament, there are prophets that talk about the things that are ahead. You know, prophets are speaking God's words and predicting the things that are coming. And we would be wise to read our prophets, uh, but Habakkuk is one that we don't read very often. Um, in fact, most of the time we can't pronounce Habakkuk's name. We stumble over his name. But he had some really good ideas about God's plan. And he says, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. Right? These events and these times and prophecies, they're there to grab our attention and to focus us on the plan that God has out there ahead. The Bible hints at this plan of God. The Bible tells us what this plan is going to be like. And the Bible confidently states that God will make this plan happen. But the Bible keeps God's plans a mystery. It's only what God can know. This, in Colossians, shows that there was a point at which God shifted. And all this mystery and all this plan that was predicted is finally revealed and finally made known. And that's what Paul is celebrating here, that God shifted and God made this plan known. The plan itself is better described in another place. It's 1 Corinthians. It says, the wisdom we speak is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though we made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. So God's plan is now out. You know, he's now public. People know it. And Paul's saying this is good, that God's mysterious plan is finally out. God revealed this plan. But what does that have to do with learning and wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Where's the learning part of this? Well, what Colossians is concerned about, as I mentioned before, is not so much that the plan was revealed or that the mystery was revealed. It's concerned about us having an understanding of what God is doing. God wants us to get what God is doing. And if God revealed God's mysterious plan, which he says is Christ, God wants us to understand all the fullness of Christ. And I think it really can be that simple. God wants us to pursue Christ and understand all the fullness of what he had in mind with this plan, what it means, the significance of it, why it makes a difference, why it matters to us, and how we change because of God's plan. 
Even Paul says, I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What if we were completely confident in God's mysterious plan in Christ that it so filled us and so moves us that we shift our lives because of Christ living in us. I mean, for sure, this was a huge shift to Paul. You know, Matt, for Paul and people in his day, this was like a brand new way. You know, we live in this day where we know that this is true. I mean, we, we can read it in the Bible. We, we've had generations of people who have testified to this. But for him, he didn't have that. This was brand new stuff. And for him, this was a huge shift in his life. And for him, the call was to pursue Christ with all he got. Think about uh, 500 years ago, during the time of the Reformation, when the churches were all in upheaval and the Catholic and Protestant or newly Protestant churches were, were vying and fighting and warring and arguing about how to live out their faith and how to live out what the Bible says. For them, Christ was a huge shift for them. The, that in Him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, they had enormous shifts because of that. And what if it's still a shift for us? I mean, even, though if we, even if we've known Christ all our lives, what shift does it mean that God's mysterious plan can still be revealed? I mean, how incredible is it that we can live in a day knowing that God has revealed this plan? We can know that Christ is everything. And if we pursue Christ, that's the way God wants us to live. Well, it's, it's remarkable that God put in Jesus everything that God had wrapped up in all of his plan. And more than that, that in Jesus lie all the treasures, lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, that's actually kind of a strange phrase, and it always catches me when I read it. That in Christ lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why are they hidden? Shouldn't they be revealed? I mean, shouldn't this be obvious? Shouldn't they be out in front? Why is anything hidden anymore? You know, God revealed the mysterious plan. God's kind of come in the open. This is all public. This is well known. Why is anything still hidden? Well, what's interesting is the word hidden appears at the end of the sentence. You know, kind of like if you're writing poetry and you want to make some, some kind of fancy meaning or make people go, oh, Paul put the word at the end of the sentence. Like, in him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. Because they're not hidden from us, they're actually hidden for us. It's like they're reserved for us. That as we pursue Christ, as we come to know and understand Christ more, these treasures of wisdom and knowledge, they were reserved for for us to discover, and we can discover them. So it's not like they're hidden away in a box and we gotta find the key to it. They're reserved for when we discover them because God reveals them to us. I mean, that, that's a remarkable way that God can hide these things away so that we can find them. So if the treasure of wisdom and knowledge are things that the Bible has always talked about as things that people ought to pursue at all costs, and that's all rooted in Christ. What does that mean? I mean, for one thing, I think it means that God's mysterious plan, Jesus is the ultimate way to a relationship with God. So the more that we pursue Jesus, the more we understand what it means to be in a relationship with God. And in the same way, the more that we seek wisdom and understanding, the more we're discovering this relationship with Christ that God has, which, is, which happens through pursuing Jesus. There's, there's a group um, that's doing this, uh, that's pursuing Jesus in some of these really basic ways. Because how, how do we pursue Jesus? Well, we read the Bible. We talk about the Bible. We understand the Bible. We discuss the Bible. We pray. All the things that the kids just talked about. Those are things that we do to pursue Jesus, to understand him more to make shifts in our lives that are smaller kinds of shifts. And there's a group that, there are a couple of groups that are actually doing this in some neat ways. Um, after the service, you know, when we have connection time for the kids, 
they all have Bibles available to them. These Bibles are available to them. And whenever they have connection time, they open the Bibles and they page through, they feel the pages, they look for the books, they read the verses. They are pursuing Christ by reading this. And when we started the slide club, we wanted to make sure that we had enough Bibles for all the kids to be able to have one and be able to open it up and find their book. And we usually have to go to the table of contents to find it and find the page number, and then we go to the page number, but they're touching Bible. And they're reading the wisdom of Christ in here. They're pursuing Christ. What if we do that? What if we pursue Christ? There are, there are lots of there are lots of us that are involved in small groups and Bible study groups and community Bible study groups and large groups and small groups and all kinds of different groups. And it's so cool to hear about more and more of them that we all are involved in. I want every one of us to have a chance to pursue Christ by reading the Bible more than just these minutes on Sunday mornings. Because it's not enough. As wonderful as the things might be that we learn on a Sunday morning, they're not enough. We all need to be pursuing Christ by reading His Word and digging into it, maybe with other people, more. And if you're not involved in something, something that's specifically River Cross or something that's community-wide or whatever it is, if you're not involved in some other occasion or some other place where you're reading the Bible, often with other people, I want to make sure that you are or you have the opportunity to do it. Um, this does not require you or sign you up for anything, but because I want that for all of us, um, this is a list. If you're not involved in something, would you be brave enough to put your name and information down? Not because we're going to start 14 new small groups and you got to sign up for the rest of your life tomorrow, but because for whoever signs up, even if it's one person or if it's more, that's fine. I want to find a way for us to be able to pursue Christ by reading the Bible more with other people. So depending on who signs up, we're going to figure out ways to connect each other together and find settings or gatherings to be able to do this together. So if your name is the only name on here, don't worry. If there's nobody else on there, don't worry. But please, if God is calling you to pursue Christ by getting involved in some way in reading the Bible with other people, please, I'm going to pass this around, and I hope that you might be willing to put your name down. Um, you can do that throughout the rest of the service, because right now we're going to pray. Let's pray.